done over the past few months on the program, as I said, with the kids say, the deep dives, right? <clears throat> Where we would talk about uh, WCW at various points, either starting with Crockett and the Great American Bash of tours and branching to when TBS bought the company of uh, the changes in booking and and scheduling and all the things that kind of uh, Dusty had somewhat got the gates back with the booking of the Bash 88 and some of the towns were strong and then the last one we did was how quickly it fell apart <laughs> and how that uh, the Great American Bash 89 was a horrible follow-up to 86, 87, 88 as far as a tour, but people fondly remember the pay-per-view because it was the one really good show of the whole month. I think that's where we kind of left it, right? Well, I realized that actually, because I haven't even thought about this, and it's one of my favorite matches, but nobody ever... I won't say nobody, but we hadn't mentioned that there was one more Great American Bash series that I was a part of. But nobody mentions the tour because when you when I look back on it, I cannot decide whether they even build it as a Great American Bash on tour in 1990 or did they just call the pay-per-view that? Because, I mean, they downplayed the tour in 89, but was there even – because I don't see anything special in the way of fucking Gates – uh, and I don't see any, you know, big uh, advertising. Do you remember? Did they even call it a tour? I don't remember it being called a tour. Well, it shouldn't have been. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just telling you. Um, here's the thing: we 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 kind of got a uh, 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 a false sense of security, as we mentioned in '89. Uh, when when Flair got the book and and the 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 quality of the matches definitely went up and of course and Funk was working his ass off and etc. Uh, the ratings went up. This is from fall '89 to February of '90. Um, the the uh, uh, ratings were up. The pay per views were doing well. The house shows were still very hard, as I, I think I recall mentioning that they never really got the house shows, but they 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 were still running house shows. Unlike in like ninety what three or four when they didn't even run any. Uh, but it, once again, they had taken a company that was going out and grossing six figures. Uh, in 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 the month of July, uh, grossing six figures in a dozen different towns and and other gates, large gates in other towns, to where in 1989 they'd really just done the sellout in Baltimore for the pay per view and 188 thousand dollar house, and they did 89 grand in Atlanta. That was the highlights of the month. In 1990, it <clears throat> they had suffered through once that Flair quit in February. And it was a couple of weeks later, I quit. And th that's the point where they went back to a committee, I believe. <laughs> and we might have to get somebody like Brian Alvarez or Dave Meltzer on the program with, that have specific dates of when everything. But I think they were doing a committee for a couple months, and then they brought Ole back. And, and Ole was – once again, charming everyone with his, you know, sunny disposition. And we got some, once again, some good and some bad in that Ole immediately brought guys like Stan Hansen back and, and, you know, tried to get some of the talent that he had relationships with, but at the same time was doing some really weird things, booking possibly just because he was more likely to have done what Jim Hurd asked him to do without fucking arguing with it. Because, all right, you know, you're the fucking boss. I don't give a shit what anybody thinks about me. I'm making the same amount of money. If you want to goddamn do something fucking stupid, I'll write it fucking right here. There you go. <laughs> I can see him doing that. Right? <laughs> so who knows? I don't fucking know, right? I went in the office at that point anyway. But they, I wanted to just go back to like May of 1990 and give you some of the highlights of what we did for the couple of months leading up to what traditionally was the biggest grossing month in by far in the company that they had just bought where they were drawing up to 25,000 people in fucking outdoor stadium shows just four years earlier 
<laughs> and still running stadium shows and drawing upwards of, of that uh, two years earlier and, and, and see what they had instead come up with after once again, you know, another couple booking changes and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the reason I go back to May is because at that point we had just agreed to sign our new contracts, me and the midnight express. And I've told a story before you can find it on YouTube um, that basically Wahoo McDaniel came into Norfolk, Virginia or Hampton, Virginia <clears throat> and told us, uh, announced to us when we thought we were finishing up that no, indeed all of the agents and all of the, everybody on the booking committee universally voted that we should all have contracts renewed and overruled Jim Hurd. And so he said, okay, and we're, we're getting our new contracts. And we immediately got fucking pissed because we were all looking forward to leaving. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, it was May that, uh, or April that that happened and May that we actually signed our contracts that I wanted to tell this story real quick as this lead up to this two months of fucking ineptitude. Uh, first on May the 4th, they were going to try to fucking invade the Northeast and run where Vince runs right again in Boston. But May 4th, WCW did not run the Boston garden like Vince used to at the time. They ran the Walter Brown arena <laughs> at, at a fucking college somewhere in fucking Boston somewhere which is all I know that I remember about it, <laughs> except that me and Stan Lane and uh, Bobby Eaton and Dutch Mantell had the rental car from the airport and finally found this place. And I was nearly, we were all nearly killed when the cop said, go down to the next light and take a left. And that's the parking lot behind the college. And we're in downtown somewhere. The left was a one way street. Well, I figured, well, he told me to, so I can at least claim that. So I'm turning left down the wrong one-way street to go in this parking lot, catty-cornered. And as I'm halfway in the median across the, to wait for the traffic to stop to turn left, we realize that we're sitting on train tracks and there's a fucking train coming down the middle of the goddamn road in this fucking place, right? And now Dutch is trying to get the goddamn seatbelt. He's strapped in the front seat with the seatbelt hooked. He can't get the goddamn seatbelt unhooked. And he's panicking, trying to open the goddamn locked door and get the seatbelt off of him so he can jump out and not be hit by the train. But we jump across the road when the traffic clears and didn't get hit by the train. But the show got hit by the train. I don't know how many, I didn't record the house because nobody told it to me. And in the fine, <clears throat> fine book, uh, WCW 1989 to 1994 by Graham Coffin, an old friend of mine, they said there's 1500 people there and I doubt it. Right. And that was the night where Luger couldn't find the fucking building. But while we got there an hour beforehand, cause we left early, he didn't get there until 10 o'clock <laughs> after Steiner was already in the ring to fucking wrestle flair. Rick Steiner was when Luger shows up and they stop the goddamn and take a second intermission while Luger gets dressed. Cause it took him till 10 o'clock to find the fucking building. And he didn't even almost get hit by a fucking train. So now we're in the fucking Northeast, right? We do that show. We get a $250 payoff We're we're actually Johnny ACE of the dynamic dudes defeated Bobby Eaton. And Stan Lane defeated Dutch Mantel because other people didn't show up. And so we had to fucking wrestle a guy that rode to the fucking matches in the car with us. Uh, because uh, whoever the fuck else didn't show up. Then the next day, we are off. We are off because we all have to fucking go to Canada. To New Brunswick. Not even to the fun part of Canada. There is a, a little part there. In the, there's out on the West Coast and in the middle, there's a couple of parts of Canada that are fun, but this was New Brunswick. We go to Canada and stay in a fucking hotel, so we start the show the next day. WCW is running Fredericton, New Brunswick. <laughs> okay, they can't run Gaffney, South Carolina, draw a fucking house, right? So Stan Lane is so miserable that when we goddamn the next day when we're off so that we can travel to fucking the next day to Canada, 
without having to go back to Charlotte first, he cracks up and he goes, he flies home, right? He can't take it anymore. Fuck these fucking people. Well, now I'm actually sick already because it, uh, it's it's unseasonable weather of some kind, and I've caught a cold. But now I can't fucking call in sick because Stan's already called in sick. So me and Bobby Eaton and Dutch Mantel continue on to fucking New Brunswick, and so Kevin Sullivan fills in for Stan against Bobby against the Road Warriors. We put them over and get another two hundred dollar payoff, of course. But we got our contract payment that day. They paid us. $3,869 as the balance they owed us on our contracts each over the previous two weeks because they were running nothing that was drawing anything and they weren't paying anybody anything. So we, we have that match that night. And then the next day is when we go to St. John, New Brunswick, and that's where the show was canceled because of the ammonia leak in the ice hockey f- floor freezing facility. <laughs> Where we got there and there was a giant line outside and, and the show was canceled because the ammonia leak inside, you, it hurt you, it burned your lungs to draw breath inside the building. And the headline the next day in the paper read, uh, wrestling show gassed. And I told Dutch it was a mercy killing. So there was a line for that one. There might have been a, a good crowd there, but we got paid 200 bucks to sit in a hotel in, in St. John. Now Stan's decision is starting to look good, right? He's gone home and I'm fucking so, I'm so sick now. I've got 102 degree fever or whatever the fuck we do Halifax where Bobby has a single match with animal and gets beat. We got 225 bucks that night. I think I was cover the cab. And then we finally get to come back to New York state uh, where Stan has (laughs) come back after his 72 hour flu was over with and rejoined the, the, the traveling troop. Uh, and I get to go to the, to, to the athletic commission doctor that night to say, please, can you give me medicine? My temperature was 102 something. I had a fucking fever. I'm coughing. I can't fucking speak. He says, come to my office tomorrow and I'll examine you and give you some antibiotics. So I worked that night <laughs> the midnight express, uh, beats, uh, Johnny ACE and the illustrious Johnny Stewart. And we get paid 150 bucks to work Syracuse in front of no fucking people. Um, and I must mention that this is the, the this is the big tour. This is the A tour. <laughs> they had they had a B tour uh, on the next day in New Mexico with the Freebirds and the Rock and Roll Express. But this is the A tour that drew like four hundred people in goddamn Syracuse. Uh, then the next day in Rochester, I go to the athletic commission doctor. He tells me I'm lucky I don't have pneumonia. He gives me antibiotics and a shot of something. And then Bobby Eaton has the people at Wendy's make me their first ever custom-made quadruple cheeseburger to welcome me back to the United States of America because I'm sick. So in Rochester, uh, we beat Johnny Ace and Johnny Stewart again in front of a $5,300 house, folks. So I guarantee you that was the high 300s or low 400s in the people uh, and then we go to Saginaw, Michigan. We can't even go to Detroit. We have to go to like, if they want to give Michigan an enema, they're going to stick the nozzle in Saginaw. Right. <laughs> and we beat Johnny Ace and Johnny Stewart again. We're, we're on the road here, folks. We're, we're traveling now. And that was a $200 payoff as well, because as I remember, it was in the hundreds of people. Oh, then we go to Detroit the next day and we work with Scott Steiner and Mike Rotunda, uh, not quite the varsity club. Um, but, uh, for whatever reason, Rick was not available. So, <laughs> and they beat us and we got 250 bucks. I'm sorry. Cause there was probably only about 1500 people there. So that was captain Mike Rotunda. That was the boat captain version of Mike Rotunda. Yeah, there you go. And, and his, they, his boat ran over us. And then we go to Chicago the next day, May 13th. And uh, this time, Animal and Mike Rotunda beat us. So the makeshift tag teams, I don't know why Animal was even goddamn uh, teaming with, uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm looking at the, because Hawk subbed for Luger, who was out with a staph infection. So that's what happened. So, uh, uh, well, there you go. So I'm the reason why, and that was May 13th in Chicago, and that was another shitty house of about 2,400 people, and we got, 300 bucks 
May 14th, we go to Indianapolis for TV, for the syndicated TV tapings. And that is where that Jim Hurd walked up to us as me and Bobby and Stan after the previous fucking since the 1st of May. We had either for this company been in goddamn like Rainsville, Alabama was May 1st, right? And for TV in Greenwood, South Carolina, and then a day off. So we starting May 4th, we'd been in Boston, New Brunswick. We'd been gassed. We'd been starved. We'd been fucking substituted and beat to death, right? And 10 days later, without getting to go home, we walk into the fucking Indianapolis building and we're headed to the locker room, me and Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane and Hurd's coming the other direction. And he's got an envelope in his hand. And wouldn't you know, it's our contracts. And he walks right up to us and hands me our contracts, the new ones that he's been outvoted over and, and, and didn't approve of and actually says, you know, I was against this. Ah! I said, we were too. We were too. We did. So, that was his management style. That was the charm of the man. After what we'd done the previous 10 days, the first thing he does is make sure that we remember that he didn't want us around. And I made sure that he remembered that we didn't want to be around him. So we do a TV there in Indianapolis and, uh, but we're basically Bobby does it work. And, and, uh, Brian Pillman beats Stan Lane with a sunset flip on TV. And then we go to battle Creek, Michigan against the rock and roll express for $200 and Dayton, same thing the next day. And, uh, then we actually get to go home. So they had us on the road for two weeks in may doing bullshit. Right. But at that same Indianapolis taping, they announced that that's when Ole took over the book and it had been the committee. Now it's Ole. So the first pay-per-view is coming up eight days later. That was the return of RoboCop on May 19th in Washington, the, the DC Armory. Capital Combat. Uh, Capital Combat. <clears throat> it was such an enjoyable day because there was no air conditioning in the building in a hot day in May in Washington. Uh, they started at seven o'clock, but a lot of the tickets listed eight o'clock. So people were still coming in an hour after the show fucking started. Um, and so this was a typical WCW production, right? But we were kind of excited because all right, Ole at that point, we figured Ole has been the booker for a fucking week. He's, he likes guys that can work. And, you know, whatever the fuck. So maybe we've got a little better opportunity here, but we've still got the herd problem. So we work with Pillman and Z-Man, Tom Zink. This was supposed to be when we started it in Altoona and they cut it off. The deal was that we were going to end up working with Pillman and, and Zink where if, if Pillman would get his revenge for us injuring his throat and somehow we would dump Zink in the climactic you know, part of the thing, but that Pillman would say, fuck it. And he would beat both members of the midnight express by himself and then get me in five minutes with me, but it wouldn't take him that long. And he'd beat me and he'd get even and be a, he'd be a top guy. Right. Well, since they hadn't done any of the rest of the fucking angle to lead up to that, Ole just said, fuck it. <laughs> we had lost the, uh, U S tag team titles to him. Ole said, fuck it. And he put the midnight over in the only match we were supposed to, to lose was the only one we ended up winning and we won the belts back from him and beat him. So then Brian and Zink just kind of looked like a plate full of piss, but at least we're the champions. Right. And then we proceed. Uh, and then we beat him the next day on TV in Montgomery, uh, uh, two days later in Montgomery, Alabama. And then we proceed to never win really another fucking match. <laughs> And they were trying to run the Road Warriors off at this point. Uh, we worked with the Road Warriors in Ozark, Alabama for $200. They're really running these shows, folks. I'm not ribbing you. That was May 22nd. I think the, the, they announced the crowd was 350 people. Um, and uh, so at any rate, that was the Road Warriors last week. Uh, May 24th in Memphis at the Coliseum was the night that that they finally said, fuck it, we'll just put you guys over because you're from here and we're leaving. So we actually pinned the Road Warriors on the way out when we weren't supposed to. The finish was supposed to be them going over, right? <clears throat> well, they made that change and it got back to the office and they got mad. 
because they were supposed to beat the Midnight Express. So the next night in St. Louis, they said, fuck it. <laughs> we're not beating it. They said, no, you have to win the match. You have to beat the Midnight Express. They said, fuck it, we're not. So they had Ellering, jer or they jerked me into the ring and had Ellering pin me, one, two, three, and that's the way they beat the Midnight Express, even though we weren't wrestling in the match. Because it was, it was that level of petty. And that the same night that the ruse people were there. Do you remember ruse Brian shoes for your feet and pockets for your stuff? Of course those commercials. I wanted a pair until I realized how impractical they were. Yeah. And stupid and out of business they are now because they were the sponsors because they were based in St. Louis and somehow heard knew them. So that's the night they did a $30,000 house in St. Louis, which is less than 3000 fucking people. And the flair and Luger had to wrestle each other for the world title wearing the fucking tennis shoes. I'm surprised they didn't break their fucking ankles, but I looked so fucking ludicrous. So this is the kind of thing that they were doing. Uh, yeah. They, they, there was 2,300 people there in St. Louis at the Keel auditorium. And then that's supposedly heard herds hometown. So that's the kind of things they had done through may and, 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 and it continued much the same in June I'm just looking to see if there's any highlights, uh, but there's actually not. And, of course, we're on the buttermilk run one weekend. They're paying me $3,000 a fucking week guaranteed, right? One weekend they had me in Gastonia, North Carolina, Beckley, West Virginia, and Frankfort, Kentucky. Me and the Midnight Express versus the fucking Southern Boys. And that was allegedly a fucking weekend of house shows that they somehow figured that they ought to run. At the same time, actually, as they they were running St. Petersburg, uh, Orlando, and Sunrise that weekend, and the best house down there was three thousand people. One of them was fifteen hundred, and that was the A team. So this continues through. We have no momentum. Um, we did a Charleston uh, or did a Clash of Champions in Charleston, South Carolina, in June, where we had I think it. it it was the midnight and rock and roll, so it wasn't bad, but it was probably our worst TV match. It was just, it was quick. It was a, a disqualification. Didn't gel, right? But it was out of nowhere. We hadn't been even working a program with them, and it didn't lead to anything. But at least we, de but we defended the U.S. Tag Team Championship. So even though we're in these tank towns every weekend or every every night, and they're drawing no people anywhere, and we're winning no matches. So somehow on television, we're still being portrayed as the champions. So we thought at least there's hope, <laughs> right? And finally, and, and June uh, it folds into July, and there was a lot of off days, which normally we had uh, leading into the Great American Bash season, where they'd give us a few days off toward the end of June because we were going to be running so hard. But then finally, the last week in June comes and listen to this schedule, Brian. And you remember that the, the main great American bash cities, uh, the previous several years had been Philadelphia, Charlotte, Richmond, Virginia, Baltimore, Landover, Maryland, uh, Norfolk, Greensboro, Fayetteville, Johnson city, Atlanta, Raleigh, Pittsburgh, Chicago, right? These big mega gates. Yeah. Yeah, well, we start the last week of June of uh, 2000 fucking or of, of 1990 in Gainesville, Georgia, on a Monday night doing a TV taping where basically we just did promos. We weren't featured on the TV show, right? I'm just speaking personally, midnight and myself. Then we go to Niagara Falls, Canada, where Bobby loses a single match to Brian Pillman and Stan loses a single match to Scott Steiner for $200. Then June 27th, Toronto, one of the great fucking North American wrestling cities, right? Of all time. And if, if you could have added to that, you know, Halcyon lineup of, of great wrestling towns that I just mentioned, you'd want a, a great American bash in Toronto, right? Except you'd want it at the Maple Leaf Gardens or at, at one of the, the at, 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 at any building that anybody's ever heard of. Once again, we're at a college someplace. <laughs> we got 200 bucks. I can't remember whether there was a thousand people there or not, but even it took us forever to get there. It was by a lake. 
And listen to this card to go to Toronto with. Ric Flair versus Lex Luger, U.S. champion versus world champion. Then TV champion Arn Anderson versus Junkyard Dog. Rick and Scott Steiner versus Doom. Midnight Express versus the Southern Boys, Tracy Smothers, Steve Armstrong. And two preliminaries. And, you know, the Southern Boys were wonderfully over, in, and I mean it, all of us. All of us Southern Boys were wonderfully over in Toronto. But, no, there was <laughs> nobody there. So we, now we've been two days in Canada. We've made $400. Then the the next day, uh, June twenty eighth is Brantford, Ontario, where somebody didn't show up because somebody else had cracked, uh, and and the, because people were leaving the trips in some cases, like Stan had, and 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 people were that was happening, right? Uh, so Bobby uh, works with Nick DiCarlo, local guy, a famous Frank Money and Nick DiCarlo tag team. Uh, Bobby beats DiCarlo and then fucking puts Rick Steiner over and Stan puts Scott over in a single match. The main events on that card that were supposed to draw the money were Lex Luger and JYD against Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. Whoever had Frank Monty is getting a mention in their drinking game this week. Drink now. Well, there you go. And Doom versus the Southern Boys. That was the the money matches uh, on that show. The following day, it was supposed to be uh, Detroit, Michigan, but it, somehow the card was changed and we were off and got to go home. But they ran Detroit. And uh, I don't know how they did, but it probably wasn't very good. And then we were actually going to be on Chicago uh, on the 30th as well, but the card was changed and we were off that too. But the main event there was Lex Luger and Paul Orndorff substituting for Sting. So the only time you'd be pissed about seeing Paul Orndorff against Ric Flair and Barry Windham and JYD versus Arn Anderson and, and the Steiners versus Doom. Uh, but that, that, was the, that was the money matches. And then they continued on July 1st in Cincinnati and drew no people and we weren't there. And then we joined up with them again on July 2nd in Marietta, Georgia, where we did another TV taping for 150 bucks. <laughs> oh, and we had just got another contract payment. We, they paid us $4,819. Uh, at least they did myself on the previous two weeks. The, uh, the payoffs did not match my contract amount. Can I ask you a question? You certainly may. If Tully had come back, if, if everything hadn't gone astray, if Jim Hurd hadn't pulled the offer and cut Arn's offer, if Tully comes back in November of 89, what do you think Tully's saying about a summer of 90? He, well, it, he would be happy with the money that he was making, and he would be the most miserable motherfucker to be sitting around in the locker room <laughs> because he would be dissecting at length and be correct. Um, <laughs> exactly what the fuck... The Yeah. So anyway, uh, we do a TV in Marietta on July 2nd. But I know you're thinking, wait a minute, July, uh, July 3rd was off. I, ju I did some radio in Charlotte, right? But you're thinking July 4th, that's the, the, you know, the big day, actually, of the month for the, yeah. you know, the month of July and a great American bash. And we were in Greensboro, North Carolina. And the Midnight Express uh, beat... The Southern Boys, or no, the Southern Boys beat the Midnight Express, and we got paid 250 bucks. It was on a Wednesday night, even though it was July the 4th. The house is not recorded in any book that I don't remember once again there being 1,500 people there. And the following day, uh, here's a big bash tradition city, July 5th, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And the same thing, $200 payoff. And then Norfolk. Now, and bear in mind, now, Greensboro, if you've missed our previous shows, Greensboro for the Great American Bash in 86 did $257,000. Uh, in 88, had done $100,000. In 90, uh, didn't even register. Norfolk, Virginia, in 1986, had sold out one hundred and fifty-seven grand. 87 had sold out 180 grand higher ticket prices. 88 had done over $100,000. We got a $200 payoff. <laughs> Nobody told us what the house was. <laughs> so finally, we get to uh, the finally. Uh, July 7th in Baltimore is the pay per view, Great American Bash 1990. Uh, because they figured, all right, Baltimore was the only house the previous year, right, that actually did good, and, and it, they'd, somehow it had become the the uh, uh, home of the Great American Bash. 
So this time, unfortunately, what they found out was they want the previous year they had wanted to remember to see Flair come back and kick shit out of Terry Funk. Yeah. Well, now they were placed in a position. Originally, Sting was going to win the championship at what was a Super Brawl, but the February pay per view when when he had Wrestle War ninety Wrestle War when he had gotten his knee injured at the Clash of Champions two weeks before, and instead Lex Luger turned babyface suddenly took his place it took Sting's place against Flair, but they, Luger did not win the title because Flair had promised the belt to Sting. Sting was supposed to be the next guy to get it. They took those things seriously back in those days, especially Flair. And so it was put off until Sting could come back amazingly uh, that quick. Uh, so they figured, okay, but the problem was even they did do 10,000 pe- people and 8,900 were paid. Uh, and I do not have the house, but we got a $400 payoff that night. And then later on, they gave us two grand on the, uh, pay-per-view, uh, but which was all against our contract anyways. It was all that we were getting to begin with, but just, at least there was some interest, but it wasn't like seeing Ric Flair come back from a near career ending injury and kick shit out of, um, uh, Terry Funk. It was, well, now they need to want to see Sting. And I think honestly, they had wanted to see Sting win it in February more than by the time they got it in July. Cause in all honesty, the company had had what in five months late more to fuck shit up. Right. And they'd gone through another, uh, actually two booking changes since sting got hurt. Flair was the booker. When he got hurt, they had a committee for fucking eight weeks and then only. So in the first six months of the year, they had three different booking teams and all these plans got blah, blah, blah. But the uh, the card was Sting versus Flair was Doom for the World Tag Title against the Rock and Roll Express, Lex Luger U.S. Title against uh, Mark Callis with Paul Lee, who would obviously later become uh, uh, Mark Calloway, uh, JYD Orndorff and El Higante against Arn Anderson, Barry Windham, and Sid Vicious, the Steiners versus the Fake Birds, Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin. Uh, and Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane, the Midnight Express, the U.S. Tag Team Champions, for whatever reason, because we lose constantly, except we never lose on pay-per-view. We beat the Southern Boys when, once again, I, we lose every television match that we have, which is non-title. We put guys over in singles matches or tag matches in every house show, but when the pay-per-views come up, somehow we win. But this time, Ole said... But now don't use the fucking racket, Cornette. Yeah, beat him with a wrestling fucking finish. It's so, all right, motherfucker. So that's why I came up with that goddamn multi-phase, you know, false finish back. Well, it's not anything ex- extravagant today with the 87 false finishes, but back when you didn't see such a thing and, and, and why that got over so well, we had another one of those mat- pesky match of the years with the Southern boys where we actually, and Tracy and Steve were a great team and they were fabulous to work with. But between that generic hootenanny music that they had him come out to on the pay-per-view and the fact that they're wearing Confederate uniform dusters in Baltimore, <laughs> you know, it, but, but by the time that the, as you remember, by the time the match was over, they stood up and cheered both teams and the match, which was the best we could hope for at that point. Cause they, they weren't going to boo us. Right. But that was. Now then, what they had finally wanted, they'd wanted to get, Heard had wanted to get that belt off of Flair and, and get it on anybody at that point, but definitely Sting. And they were, were thinking they were going to, you know, now with Ole as Booker, bring in some new blood, Ole, which is when Re- Ole started bringing in those guys who were greener than pepper trees, right? Um, but what they had done once again to the backbone of the business, let continuing the Baltimore bash. Yes. The pay-per-view they did draw a halfway decent house, but then we come back down to fucking earth, uh, the following day when we go back to Roanoke, Virginia, and, and we actually, we get beat by the rock and roll express. Um, but for this time, a $300 payoff, they just basically pay you a couple or $300 in those days, WCW to pay for your road expenses to go in and have these matches in front of no people and do TV tapings. And then they were just sending guys their contract payments afterwards, which was what bred 
such complacency in guys, whether they showed up or not, how hard they worked or not. If you, if you, if you didn't give a shit and were just there for the money, you were happy. But if you gave a shit, you were fucking frustrated as fuck. So that kind of had the locker room somewhat split down the middle. Uh, in July 9th, uh, we go back to Gainesville for uh, another Gainesville, Georgia for another TV taping. And then we, uh, we get two days off because we went to uh, do that awake on the wild side MTV appearance for some reason. They couldn't draw a house in any major city in the country, but they got us on MTV. And the reason why it was us was because they they asked for somebody who could actually talk on television, halfway cut a promo, and they knew wouldn't show up or show up in the morning hungover. So it, it boiled down to me and the Midnight Express. Uh, but at the same time, they have a crew out west. They ran the Tulsa on July 12th. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, that was where we picked it up. They were somewhere on the 11th, but on the 12th, we're in Tulsa and I actually do a $32,000 house, almost 3000 people. There's a little life there. We worked with the Southern boys, but, uh, they, it was, it was, a, a at least a, a, a pulse of a house show. Right. And, and, but you still got your 300 grand, uh, Dallas the following day. Uh, was uh, thirty two th- or uh, maybe about thirty thousand dollars, and you got your three hundred dollar payoff. The following day, they're in St. Louis, the home of the NWA and the home of goddamn Ruse and the home of Jim Hurd and the home of everything. And for a Great American Bash level uh, production, they draw thirty thousand dollars, and we get three hundred bucks, and we work with the Southern Boys. It was almost like a vaudeville team at that point that was just going out in these interchangeable buildings in front of approximately the same number of people. And, and uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, then our contract payment was only 3200 bucks that week because they actually raised the, the per diem we were getting the 300 bucks. And I know people are saying, well, Cornette, you're complaining about the fucking money. But as I've mentioned, we were making more money when Crockett was doing the payoffs and we didn't have a guaranteed contract that we were at this point from these fucking people. And it was at least it, it was, it, I was always proud of being able to go out in these big shows. We got up for the big shows, the bash matches where we've drawn this crowd and the building is sold out and our performance is, is a key part of it. And you took pride in that rather than going out in these dead atmospheres in half these towns, you shouldn't be in anyway, and and the and that the office couldn't sell pussy on a troop train, much less a wrestling ticket. No matter Frank fucking Gotch was on the card, and it was a very trying era. Anyway, um, on July sixteenth, we're back in Gainesville, Georgia, which is the only place they could do a syndicated TV show anymore, uh, and we got one hundred fifty bucks. And then, thankfully, the Midnight and I got a couple of days off. I think they gave the whole company a few days off. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, why run them in the middle of bash season? Thursday, July 19th was Savannah, Georgia. $350 payoff against the Steiners. Friday, July 20th, Augusta, Georgia did thirty nine grand. We had the Steiners, and I remember enjoying that. Because it, in Augusta, thirty nine grand looked good, and I was like, "Why the fuck that this happened? We don't know. It must have been accidental." But we enjoyed it very much. Uh, that J- July twenty first, Saint Petersburg, Florida. Now remember, they've done bashes in Jacksonville and done six figure houses in the past, and and Florida's a legendary wrestling area, right? Saint Petersburg, thirty two grand. On July 21st, so less than 3,000 people at the Bayfront Center. And uh, it, it, the uh, I, as a matter of fact, you'll love this. This was, show was snake bit. Not only did Sting and Luger beat Barry Windham and Harley Race instead of Ric Flair, because Flair actually did have a staff infection in his knee and couldn't work. He was in the corner. So Harley had to work in the main event. But also, that's when Stan was going through that uh, paternity suit dispute, shall we say. And he was found not guilty, folks, or whatever the the verbiage is. But he couldn't work in Florida at that point in time. So Buddy Landell fills in with Bobby Eaton as, as the 
Midnight uh, uh, Nature Boy Midnight Express against the Steiners. That's where we're having the match, and the light in the Bayfront Center gets so hot it, it explodes, and the hot burning glass falls in the ring on top of all of us, melting the plastic of my tennis racket cover. The fucking show was snake bit from the fucking start. It was goddamn rotten. So then we're in Miami the following day, 2,000 people at the fucking night center. Same basic result. Then guess where we went back to on Monday, July 23rd, Brian Last? You'll never guess this. Gainesville, Georgia. Gainesville, Georgia to do the fucking <laughs> TV tape. is goddamn what the fuck? It, it was insane. Then we had a couple of days off. Thank fucking God. Uh, after all of that mess, then we go to Charleston, South Carolina on July 26th, do $29,000 match against the Steiners in Richmond, Virginia. Let's see. Richmond in 1986 did $115,000 sellout and 87 did 125 grand at 88 did $109,000 and actually did 140 for the show that followed it up that year in 89. They didn't run one. I don't believe, or if we did, I don't know what it did. And they came back in Friday, July 27th. They ran Richmond, Virginia at the Coliseum. We wrestled the Steiners. Also on that card, Ric Flair, all the top fucking names. Nobody was there. $250 payoff. We had like fucking couple thousand people, maybe. And then we had a couple more days off. Uh, although they did run Asheville and they just included us and, and Knoxville and included us out, but uh, nothing happened. And then on Monday, July 30th, I know you're not going to believe this, but guess where we were? Gainesville, Georgia. But I, but it, actually the boys, the boys didn't have to go to Gainesville those past couple of weeks. Just me, because I had to host the goddamn Louisville Slugger. I forgot. They weren't even there. They weren't featured on the TV tab the last three weeks in a row. So every week I would just get up and drive to fucking Gainesville, Georgia. And do the Louisville Slugger where I'd do a 30-second intro and then interview somebody else about fucking their upcoming shit. And then I would literally get in my fucking car and come back home. So it was a 420-mile round trip to do a three-minute fucking pre-tape. And people wondered why I hated the fucking people. <laughs> but at least the midnight were off TV, so they couldn't beat us anymore. Uh, so that was the, the best part about that period. But it was just once again. And that's when Ole had uh, – I, I want to give you the uh, – Oh, and, and Tuesday, July 31st and Wednesday, August 1st, uh, were off for myself and the Midnight Express and apparently everybody else because they didn't start running uh, shows until uh, uh, the 2nd of August where they were in Columbia, South Carolina. And then back in Greensboro uh, uh, on August 3rd where they were lucky to do 4,000, but we were in Pittsburgh that night where they did probably about 1600 and we got 200 bucks. But I, let me give you the Greensboro show for the 1st of August, where Ole had been booking for a while. The Star Blazer pinned Dutch Mantel. Norman the Lunatic, <laughs> well, I think he'd become a trucker, Yeah, pinned Zan Panzer, who was uh, Brad Anderson. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Gene Anderson's so, son. Yeah. Tommy Rich beat Buddy Landell. In 1990, <laughs> Big Van Vader pinned Tom Zink. I can't argue with that. Mike Rotunda defeated the Iron Sheik. That's when they, 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 they brought the Sheik back to see if they could get some jobs out of him because Ole's like, fuck him, we're going to pay him. Gonna... And the jobs were so bad, they sent him back told, and paid him for the rest of the year. Uh, Trey, Trey Smothers and Steve Armstrong, the Southern Boys, defeated Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin, the fake bird, fabulous fake birds. NWA TV champion Arn Anderson and Barry Windham defeated the Junkyard Dog and Paul Orndorff. NWA world champion Sting pinned Ric Flair, but then Flair, Anderson, Windham got heat on. Uh, okay, it's a nice little house show, but that wasn't the Great American Bash, right, or anything like it. None of that shit was. They didn't even try. They didn't even make an effort. At that point, it was okay. Let's we got these contract guys. And let's get some guys that can can work cheap underneath. Because in Pittsburgh, uh, we actually we defeated uh, instead of Johnny Ace and local that we were originally booked against. We beat uh, uh, Brad Armstrong and Dave Sierra, the Cuban assassin. Bam Bam Bigelow pinned Wendell Cooley. Mark Callis pinned Doug Furness. The Steiners beat Samoan SWAT team. Lex Luger versus Sid Vicious. 
Rock and Roll Express versus Doom, and El Higante won a 14-man battle royal. I have no memory of Wendell Cooley working for WCW in 1990. I think he brought. I think when they were running, trying to run two towns a night, and it didn't last long, so he didn't either. But the the point there was talent there, but it was spread out over two towns, and in one case it was town. To, and oh, and that Pittsburgh wasn't even the Civic Arena either. It was some fucking off-brand building in town. It it, it, it had come to that. So th- th- basically, that's the point. Is you see that. Everybody has such fond memories of the Great American Bash in the mid '80s for a reason, because they were huge cards with guys that were hot currently at the time and a big time promotion. And whether you like it or not, and we didn't most of the time. Even the country music stars, it was name people doing big shit at at major arenas in town. And all of a sudden, it had become these fucking wrestlers that can't find the goddamn high school or college gym in fucking downtown Boston in front of anywhere from 300 to goddamn 1500 people most of the time and occasionally a, a couple of grand to do the same shit that they did every fucking night and for the same basic money and it and that's not it demoralized i think the roster as much as everybody will say uh they enjoyed obviously getting the money that they were supposed to get it, whether they'll tell you the truth or not, it, when it when it when that became all you were going to get, it demoralized you because you were in the wrestling business because you always had the carrot. You always thought if we get hot and we get on top, because they said, "Oh fuck, you know, if you go to fucking Louisiana, Watts will screw you." Well, he screwed us, but he also paid us fucking six figures one year more than anybody else would have in fucking in that that era. And then within a couple of years, we're working for Jimmy Crockett, who on payoffs paid us almost double that uh, a couple of years later. But when you felt you were a contribution to the increase in the business and you were featured part of the show, that's when anybody that's been in in that position in the WWE will tell you that's when you did your shit. That's when you, you really put your passion into things. But if you're doing the same shit every night for about the same return, both in terms of live audience feedback and financial gain, and you know, because of the place you're working, there's not good. It's not going to get a lot better. It hemp, it hampers, it hinders or hampers your performance. I'm on the soapbox now. Well, let me ask you this, Jim, you quit WCW right after Halloween havoc 90, Jim Hurd lasts about a year more, maybe a little less than a year. Dusty comes back as Booker. In the beginning of 91, you revealed here on the show a little while back that you had conversations with Dusty about coming back at that point. But, of course, Jim Hurd was still there. Jim Hurd was still there. When you quit, I mean, did you have any idea in your mind? Did you think Jim Hurd's going to have this job for the next five years? Did you think he would last only a year? Like, when you quit, how much longer did you think Jim Hurd would be there? Actually... At that, I didn't stop to evaluate that at that particular point in time. Um, but it, it, I had no reason to believe he was going anywhere, and it wasn't like he was in a, uh, rushed out the door anytime after that. Um, it, it, it didn't seem it mattered what kind of talent he ran off or what kind of bonehead shit he did or stuff he foisted off on television or, or the, even the stuff that he suggested that he couldn't foist off or whatever. Nobody had made any move to act like that he had any heat whatsoever because we all heard his best friend was paired. I won't say his best friend. Petrick's wife was his wife's best friend or right. whatever. That's how he got the fucking job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, no, but at the same time, at that point, I knew, the, I knew the company was going to be a fucking mess for the foreseeable future, no matter because as we'd seen going through all those booking changes and the houses – sucking and the the schedule sucking and the whole thing you know it it wasn't going to get different anytime soon and i was not going to enjoy it anytime more and all i was looking for was the following may anyway because that's when our contracts would be up again so i knew at that by by october i knew no may fuck this if they try to give us another one i ain't taking it we you know we we wanted to, at the the previous one we wanted to stay because where else are you going to get that kind of money guaranteed and it and I, we still had the element of this is our fucking place more than it is that motherfuckers we've been here longer 
We've helped more, you know, helped build it more, et cetera. We'll wait to motherfucker out. But by that point, it was like, no, May will be it. So all I was looking at was six months ahead of time anyway. On the topic of contracts, you've obviously been dealing with Jim Hurt a lot because you're on the booking committee with Ric Flair. You already don't like him, but you've been dealing with him for a long time, and I'm sure Bobby and Stan aren't. They're just hearing through you what's going on. So I'm curious what their reaction, specifically Stan, when that moment happens when Jim Hurd walks up to you and says, I was against this, and hands you the contract, and now they're witnessing Jim Hurd. I don't know how much they had seen beforehand, but what was Stan and Bobby's reaction to that moment? I th- well, it, it also, I'm sure he had walked by him in the hallway a few times. Um, <laughs> we used to joke that Jed fucking George Scott has not to this day spoken to Bobby Eaton. When he came, <laughs> no, when he came in... We had a meeting where he never actually addressed Bobby by looking at him and speaking directly to him. Uh, The one meeting where he said, I just, his famous quote was, I just don't know what I'm going to do with you boys. And one other time when we were going into the meeting, Bobby held a door open for him and he walked right past Bobby. Like he was, so he's Bobby started calling himself Casper, the ghost. (laughs) Um, And it was about the same thing from her. They didn't. And, and they were, well, Bobby never says anything about anybody, but you know, I mean, even Bobby was not, of complimentary I mean, he just you know gave that kind of the bobby thing mm. uh but no stan was not because I, I said i said look at that and just to make sure they heard it we huddled afterwards i said just to make sure i heard that right right fuck but it, it well hold on though after that first meeting with george scott who was the first person to say did you notice he didn't talk to bobby um it, I think we we kind of mutually came up to what the fuck because I think Bobby <laughs> just said, "Am I here? Am I am I, am I invisible? Am I Casper?" Um, and that's a th- they already knew what the fuck Hurd's issue was and and the way he felt about the whole goddamn thing. So it wasn't a surprise. And and once again, we were not signing those contracts because we were all gung ho about you know, staying part of the team. We were signing them honestly because the team needed to stay together and we couldn't tell Bobby not to take a six figure job when he had kids and we did not. Uh, that was, so that was already the joyous occasion upon which we were signing that uh, agreement to begin with. You, Dennis and Bobby famously met with Vince McMahon in, I believe the summer of 86 about potentially coming up there. And you've told that story many times. While all this is going on, do you at all think maybe I should talk to someone up there? Maybe I should approach them? I mean, the Road Warriors just go up there in the spring of 1990, and obviously there are several other defections in the next year and a half. Uh, No. (laughs) Because by then, to me, to be honest with you, Stan was not going to wrestle but another couple of years, as you'll recall. Did you know that already? Um, No. Did you think it? No, he didn't know that either. He didn't know that until he just decided one day. But the thing was, I think Stan probably – Bobby was just like, okay, here, give me – because it's our home and we're in Charlotte. He's still in – he had bought a house. He's still in his house. It was his six figures. Give it to me. All right, whatever the fuck. Stan, I think, was now looking more at the goddamn schedule like it was almost like – well, fuck, they'd actually, they would beat us to death on the road in the WWF. And at that point, it, it was now a situation where we would have had to have worked harder on the body in the WWF than we were in what the fuck we were doing, right? Stan's thinking, I'm I'm losing fucking singles matches to fucking Art Bar with a sunset flip. Why the fuck argue? And I was not going to bring it up because if we made that commitment, I already had the germ of Smoky Mountain Wrestling by summer of 1990. So I wasn't going to do anything else after WCW, but that, and whether I could, regardless of whether I could have, or how much, whether I would have made more money. You've been pretty vocal about the positives. And I should probably stress the negatives of the 1989 tag team scene in the NWA. What did you think in 1990? Now you have the Southern boys, the nasty boys come in there right before you leave. What did you think about what was happening in terms of tag team wrestling doom and the Steiners on top? Well, it it was it was great. I wish we could have been a, a, a bigger part of it. The thing was, is with they had all those great tag teams, but at the same time, not only were they starting to kind of subvert 
the tag team title. When they had a tag team main event, it was more uh, combinations of the top baby faces. What were they during the, the were they the dudes with attitudes during Oli's time? The dudes with attitudes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the fucking people gave them the attitude, but uh, it was, it was tag matches with them against some group that could be identified as horsemen. But, the, the, you know, I've said I, I, I don't think that Garvin and Hayes as the Freebirds worked, but it wasn't horrible. But they they still continued trying to go, probably because of Ole's past experience with Michael and those guys, but they tried to continue going with them. Doom was a great team, um, and, and I liked both Ron and Butch and thought that they were fresh and new, and so that was great. But I wish we'd have got a chance to work more with the Steiners because – not only did the Steiners like working with us, but they had their best matches with the Midnight Express because we didn't have to worry about being the big guys that couldn't be thrown around. And it, and so it was easier for the Steiners to do their shit. But every time we'd have some type of really good match with them, we'd never fucking work with them again for the next two months and, and, and never on a big show. And with the Southern Boys, same thing. We have the, the match at the Bash where the, the people in Baltimore give the Southern Boys a, a standing ovation. And then never again on a big shot. I think we had one other TV match with them. So we couldn't get any programs going with anybody to do any good because of just the stop, start, haphazard booking. What the fuck? As everybody remembers, our last pay-per-view match was against Riggy Morton and Tommy Rich because Robert Gibson had hurt his knee. So, but on pay-per-view, the Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich, the first time ever teaming, Beats the Midnight Express in the opening match, which also happens to be one of the top two best matches of the fucking night. And we can't even beat the makeshift team. It, it just got to that point where all the tag teams were just in a, a puddle down there, subverted like a plate full of piss. And nobody was standing out and they weren't keeping the, the guys strong that could actually get other guys over. It, it, so there was a lot of talent there. They were just, you know, it was like a pinball game. They were bumping around against each other. Let's say you had had the program with the Steiner brothers. How would Stan Lane have liked working with the Steiners every night for two months? Uh, probably not, but, you know, <laughs> actually, no, they were, <laughs> they, they, no, Rick and Scott were both always really, I won't say professional because that indicates that they wouldn't be with other people, but they were, and I don't want to say careful because they didn't baby anybody, but they were very careful with, with the Midnight Express because they respected them because they were veterans and because they learned shit when they got in the ring with them. And Scotty had only been working a couple of years at that point. And they had, like I said, their most exciting matches where it was, they could, they could do all their shit and do it easier than with anybody else with us. So they always took care of us to make sure that nothing happened. I, we never had any complaints working with the Steiners. I'm curious too, you know, obviously you have all these records and they're incredible and I'm looking forward to some of the deep dives that we're going to do in the months ahead here on the show. But in terms of the nomad period between WCW and Smoky Mountain Wrestling, do you have the detailed information for all those shows you worked? VWA, GWF, everything else you but, worked? Believe it or not, I won't, I won't say detailed, but I do. Ha yes, I have, uh, I have that written down also. And, and I was actually, I just grabbed it before I grabbed my 90 book. And I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you, to tell anybody <laughs> what, what I actually worked for back in those days when I, I'd never, that's the thing in 1991, I had never really done an independent show because they were before that they were outlaw shows and I'd never done that type of thing. So I wasn't used to a, a guaranteed payoffs, nor was anybody at that point. It was just getting started guaranteed payoffs and everything. So I'll look at a couple of things I did for a couple of people that you know, it was either close to home or, Oh, he so-and-so was a nice guy. I'm like, why did I do that? Or one of those Joel Goodhart paydays. No, well, no, those that, that was actually the biggest, except for the uh, LPWA tapings where I was doing commentary and 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 helping produce behind the scenes, et cetera, et cetera. That was my biggest payoffs of the year for Joel Goodhart. Well, so, you, well, you turned down your biggest opportunity during that time, so I mean, it's no wonder. Which one was that? The, the opportunity to book for Universal in Japan for shit. Oh, well, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot when, <laughs> when Dr. Mike Leno huffed a little extra nitrous and got me booked in Japan. But that's another day, folks. But anyway, but as, so so basically, as you can see, by 1990, W said they were they were touring, I, I guess, under the theory of, well, that way we'll take in some money to pay the wrestlers, but they were losing so much money. It was more like they were touring just because they thought they were supposed to. I don't know. 
but they didn't care about anything except the TV ratings and the, and the pay-per-view. But those were once again on a downswing because, and well, I'm just going to state facts again. Flair had gotten them up, but then you have not one, but two booking changes in booking direction in like a fucking two month period. And Ole was shot as a booker in, in 1983. Well, and, and once again, Ole didn't do himself any favors as with a lot of this stuff where he just went great, you know, was, thus became the master blasters and the legendary stories of all the green guys. I was there that night when Nash's original fucking partner was in the ring with Brad Armstrong and Tim Horner at the Cobo in Detroit. And, and we were back in the back watching and the guy fucked up the same spot three different ways, three times in a row with Brad Armstrong. And to the point where he just turned around and looked at Nash and spread his arms out wide as if to pantomime clear as day. It was the only piece of work he did that was good in the whole match. What do they want from me? I don't understand what I'm doing here. It was just like that, <laughs> right? And he went to the bus station. He quit that night. He went to the bus station and took a bus out of town and never came back. They never saw him again. Well, you're in trouble when Kevin Nash is the Bobby Eaton of your team. Oh, boy. Boy, howdy. Uh, but that was that was what... <laughs> He was doing, he was just, you know, he was just trying to cheap guys. And, and I can honestly see Ole not arguing with Jim Hurd nearly as much as, as Ric Flair had, or as anybody else had, or even as probably Jim Ross did. He's probably, okay. You think, you know what the fuck you're doing? Okay. Hurd, here you go. You're the fucking boss. I'm getting the same fucking check either way. I could be in Minnesota at the fucking lumber mill. Here you go. Boom. Done. So I, who knows, but it, it just, they dismantled the whole fucking thing. And it was, it was till the late nineties that they started drawing any kind of crowds and live again. And they eventually did cut house shows and stop running house shows. And in one way, that seems like a really bad move, but in another way, if it's just costing you money and it's not making you any money, why do it? Yeah. And, and they figured out a way for the primary source of income in the wrestling business to actually cost them money. <laughs> And that was why, you know, that was the pretty much the origination. I mean, I'm sure somebody had thought of it before then, but that became the blueprint for what happens when the dream of everybody in the wrestling business comes to fruition and a multi, multi millionaire media company buys a wrestling promotion. There's no stopping us now. Oh, yes, there is, because it will be a self-inflicted wound that takes you down every time. What's the recipe for disaster in wrestling? Just add suits. And we have the company known as WCW World Championship Wrestling to thank for it. So that's the, that's the kid's lesson in history for this week. 